to be hearing from Lord Meghna Desai. He is Emeritus Professor of Economics at London School of Economics and Political Science. And together with him is David Marsh. David is the Chairman and Co-Founder at the official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum. David is going to be having a chat with Lord Desai and they will later be joined by Jack and Dennis for a further on the panel for a further discussion. So again, if you have questions for this panel, you can start putting them down on paper. Otherwise, I am going to hand over the time to David. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, could I have a bit of quiet in the room, please? Thank you. So we're now going to go seamlessly into uh, a question that Jack Liu made very forcibly, the importance of Europe. I was very struck both by uh, Dennis and Jack, your comments. It was like the voice of reason and common sense coming from the United States these days. It's not something you see every day of the week. Uh, so thank you both of you very much indeed for being here today. And also you're going to be joining us on the panel here in half an hour. Um, I'm here with uh, Lord Desai, Professor Desai from the London School of Economics, uh, who was born in India but is a British member of the House of Lords. So basically, he, r he runs the country without being elected, uh, uh, which is something which does happen from time to time in Asia, so, so I've been told. Uh, it just shows a certain harmony in the way we do things between Europe and Asia. But Meghna has been a very long a supporter of European integration and European prosperity, but also somewhat dubious about the way that Europe has been going. Now, uh, Meghnad, from your vantage point, over many years of looking at Europe, and I have to say that uh, Meghnad is also the chairman of the advisory board of OMFIF, the institution that we set up about nine years ago, uh, something that Jack said uh, struck a chord. Uh, he said that when Europe acted uh, after the financial crisis, it took a lot of coordination because this is a collection of sovereign states with one monetary union with 19 countries. Britain is not part of that, of course. Do you think this is something God-given, something deeply in the system, that it was very difficult to get over that huge problem of coordination? When you think about it, uh, a principal instrument would be fiscal policy. Uh, and fiscal policy without a central state which has transfer mechanism is very difficult to do. Now, I think the EU makes difficulty for itself because when they chose to set up a single currency, the euro, uh, they set it up without, again, a, a central uh, a fiscal agency. And so they have chosen a highly deflationary monetary system in which, uh, you know, to use some words from long ago, there is no outside money. A, no individual government can, can, you know, finance its debt by printing money. Uh, you, know, you know, people don't like printing money to finance debt, but n not having, not being able to do it at all takes you back to the gold standard. And this is a gold standard without occasional California mines getting, uh, giving you more gold or South African. You know, at least in a gold standard, periodically the exogenous supply of gold went up. This is a currency in which there is no way of increase the supply of the currency except by debt creation through private sector credit. Uh, and so in the, it, there's only inside money, no outside money. So there is no way of stimulating the economy by either monetary policy or by fiscal policy because the gold standard requires you to have balanced budgets all the way through the growth and stability pact. So, how can you devise a counter-cyclical policy in a system in which an individual country has no uh, way of increasing its money supply, no way of running a budget deficit, and no way of depreciating its currency? So there are no macroeconomic tools left. And because there is no central government, there is no central fiscal or monetary policy. So do you think there's any way of resolving this? Because lots of people put their finger on that point at the beginning. The Deutsche Bundesbank, for example, I remember lots of papers they produced in the 1990s <coughs> saying you need a political union 
to make a monetary Absolutely. union work. Now that the monetary union was set up without a political union, do you think, as some Europeans benignly believe, that with a few crises you'll get a political union now to come in and rescue the situation, a bit like the cavalry marching to the victory in, in, yeah. a, in, the, in some US war? Do, exactly. do you think there will be a rescue of political union through the no. back door? You know, a crisis can lead either to a positive solution or to a negative solution. It's not predictable. You know what's happening now, increasingly within the EU, as you know, with the, with the new Italian government. And the Italian government is very anti-Euro. They're not happy about the way Italy has had to suffer. Because Italy, through the 60s and 70s and 80s of last century, grew by continually depreciating the lira. And, and, and they had industrial expansion and all that, but they took, a, they took inflation as, as a cost. Now, Italy has had no economic revival for, in, for decades, and I think they are now almost willing themselves to disrupt the European Union rather than join Macron and uh, uh, Merkel in further unification, further integration of, of, uh, of the European Union. And you also have the same thing in Eastern Europe, that countries like Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and so on, they are more nationalistic. There are a lot of nationalism within the European Union. And the nationalism of individual regions is contrary to the spirit of the European Union. And you know they hadn't thought about it, and now it is happening. So I think you, the euro as a currency is going to face more problems. Uh, rather than having a simple centralizing solution as Macron would like. And how important is this? Because Jack was making the point, the reason why uh, America became quite vexed about Europe and its problems uh, under the Obama administration was because you felt it would be a threat to the world recovery. Um, how important is Europe, do you think, also to ASEAN, given the fact that Europe, although a very rich part of the world, is making up an ever smaller part of world GDP? Sure. How much should all you people in the room care about Europe. Yeah. Well, you know, we were, I mean, both, both the previous speakers were talking about 10 years of recovery for the US economy. You can't talk about recovery in the European Union at all. Some, some countries have performed well, others. By and large, it has been a very low level of recovery in Europe. And also, you know, even, even in the UK, which is not in the Euro, the idea now is that the current generation of young people have lost out relative to their parents and grandparents. Now that, you know, the, the idea is that yes, things are not going to get better for them as they were for the children. Now, if the economy can't very soon break that uh, despondency, there will be an incentive to break up some of the European Union. I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying it will happen day after tomorrow. But there are strong pressures now, and with immigration adding to the pressure uh, on individual countries, you want to say we can do better out than, than in. I'll get on to the question in a moment of what will happen next. But first, just a word about monetary policy, since we had a, a very good talk by Dennis Lockhart on quantitative easing. Now, the ECB has been the nearest thing we've had to the US cavalry really riding to the rescue, because the ECB has rescued the euro over the last five or six years through this slightly tardy but now very important quantitative easing program. Mario Draghi has kept the show on the road, so to speak. There's going to be a new Mario Draghi in a little more than a year. It may be a German, maybe a Frenchman taking over, we don't know. Can the ECB permanently be the lender of last resort to bail out Europe when things get bad? Well, you know, the, the principal uh, driving force behind the euro, as you know, because you've written a very good book about it, is are uh, the Germans. And the Germans are obsessed about inflation, more obsessed than anybody needs to be. So they will not allow any relaxation of, of uh, the norms that they want uh, the central bank to follow. And it was surprising that Mario Draghi got away with what he did. Uh, you know, when, when, when the need was there. But now I think it will be very difficult for a new uh, ECB uh, uh, president to go and try to do, you know, uh, sort of quantitative easing 
you know, again, the interest rates are already low enough in, in EU. So I think, no, the, the, if there was to be serious recession, the ECB has very little room to move. And what's more, again, as you know, the German Constitution Court may not allow uh, these sorts of operation uh, by the ECB because they, they have their own rules about what German state can take part in or not take part in. You've got to, though, understand the Germans somewhat because the Bundesbank now owns about one third of all the German government bonds ever issued. And uh, they do then think of the Weimar Republic, don't they? They think oh, down that road lies perdition. And after all, the whole issue about monetary unit is supposed to be banning monetary financing. Now, that looks very much like monetary financing of some sort or another. So you do have to understand the German strictures here. But what about the other people, the French, who they say this is actually just the Germans rigging the show for their own means? They have a huge current account surplus. The German euro is undervalued. And the Germans are getting an unfair advantage from a trading point of view. What, what do you say about that criticism of Germany? I'm I, quite, quite rightly put. I'm sorry. I've, 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 I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not an inflationist, but I really hate deflation more than I hate inflation. Let me put it that way. My, my asymmetry is very much against below two percent, and, and, and you know, rather than uh, much, much about two percent. I think you know what, what it, you know, if you actually go back and read history, in the Weimar Republic. The sabotaging of the currency was a determined policy move. It didn't happen by accident. They wanted to smash the currency to escape reparations payments. I mean, this is all recorded you know, in, in when the French moved and occupied the Ruhr uh, you know, to get some more money. The, the, the Germans sabotaged the currency. OK, and it's a very painful experience. And then they had a very painful experience in the, in the 1930s. But why should they visit their problems on everybody else? They got into the euro with a depreciated Deutschmark, uh, you know, and, and they have enjoyed an enormously good depreciation for, for all these years and accumulated a trade surplus. So people are, people are justified in saying that you know, this is a system in which one country has captured all the gains, and for the rest of us, it, it is a cost, and look the way Greece was treated. Greece is being treated. I mean, how can any member country be treated like that in the Union with absolutely no accommodation uh, to, to, the, to the future generations? They have to uh, maintain 30 years of budget surplus. I mean, 30 years of budget surplus. Which country has ever achieved 30 years of budget surplus? So, so Greece is not out of the woods. Um, no. I mean, J Jack was saying that there is some light at the end of the tunnel there, but it's a very long tunnel, isn't it's it, for Greece? It's a long tunnel indeed. No, it's a long tunnel because the system is so rigid. You know, I've been saying for some time that they ought to be allowed to have a local currency which trades at a variable rate with the euro, you know, sort of a dual currency system. Uh, yes, it would be, it, 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 that, that currency would be inflationary, but in some cases, you might choose to pay the cost by more inflation than a lot of unemployment. See, that's another trade-off. There is no such choice in the European system. You have to take it in unemployment because there's no other policy instrument left to you. And you know, I, I worry, I like the European Union very much, but I worry that the having the euro as a currency is going to create considerable tensions, especially now, because the economic uh, uh, cycle has not yet, yet got any, any momentum in Europe. And the immigration problems are increasing the tension on, on, on individual countries. Just one point on monetary policy before we go on. And also, I would also like, Steve, say if there's anybody who's got any questions, you'd like to write them down in very large letters in capitals, and please bring them up here. That, that would be great. But on monetary policy, given the German neuralgia for whatever reason about inflation, um, it's sometimes actually quite a historical. People forget that the Reichsbank in 1923, when inflation was about 2,000 billion percent, they, they forget that the Reichsbank was actually independent of the German government. It was run by the Allies in, in those days after the <laughs> First World War. But given that history, would it make sense for a German to take over the ECB next year? If you were the person who could basically decide these things in Europe, would you give the job to a German, a Frenchman, or an Italian? My, you know, my view is that, uh, my view is that uh, 
give it to the guilty party uh, rather than give it to Italian raise hopes which only will be dashed because uh, the, the ECB president doesn't have as much room for maneuver. I mean, Draghi got away with it. Nobody else is going to get away with it. And I would is rather... It because Mr. Draghi is a Jesuit that he has got a special way of dealing with people and you can only do that once, can't you? No, I mean, you know, it, I, I remember we, we were talking at that time that when, after 2008, the only innovative institution in the European Union was the ECB. That there's no other innovative institution. And they got away by doing this, which was not in the rule book. I mean, Draghi made it up and succeeded. I think you called it at the, at the time a confidence trick, but it did work because they've never had to use the outright monetary exactly, transaction. Absolutely. Yeah. And you could only really do that once. But uh, uh, just to repeat my question, you said give it to the guilty party. Who do you mean? Germans. You, so um, you, you would let uh, Mr. Yeah. Weidman take yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first from, from the House of Lords, the <laughs> House of Lords recommendations. Now, l let's just talk about Britain leaving the European Union because this panel is supposed to be about Europe and the Euro. What difference does that make to the continent? Hard to say because we still have to see the final shape of the Brexit uh, rules and regulations. How much... Uh, in manufacturing, it's quite clear that the, that the European Commission holds the upper hand and the UK needs in the customs union arrangements to continue. In the services sector, it is in Europe's interest to give a, a good equivalence relationship and continue life as it is because the London financial center is a much greater benefit for, for the EU as many countries raise money in London. And if they disrupt that, then EU will pay a price. UK will pay some price, and EU will pay a much bigger price if they deprive themselves of the London uh, financial markets. But you know, the one great uh, lesson of the whole Brexit exercise is people don't do things rationally uh, you know, in their self-interest. They go out and do foolish things. Uh, and and it, it, the irrationality of the two sides in the Brexit negotiations is, is sta staggering. But they go on doing this because each is playing a political game with their own citizens, not even with each other. And it is, a, let's just hope that you know, sense prevails or they don't succeed in, in you know, their worst uh, scenarios. And we get a reasonable soft Brexit with not too much disruption uh, uh, to the trade after uh, after Brexit. But do you think what happened in Britain is, if you like, a forerunner of what might be happening in other countries? Because we heard earlier today about austerity and the feeling of people being left behind by globalization also drives uh, voters to the political fringes. We're certainly seeing it in Italy, as, as you've seen. We're seeing it in France. We're seeing it in Germany now with a party to the right of the Bavarian CSU now in Parliament for the first time since the 1950s. Is what Britain is going through, is that a forerunner of fragmentation and polarization elsewhere, which could be really dangerous for the European project? No, I think, you know, the, the leadership in Europe, in uh, German and French, have not yet come clean on the fact that, you know, they set up the Euro to save uh, exchange rate, uh, the cost of exchange rate transactions. I don't think that cost was large enough to justify this severely deflationary currency. And not, not having spent time on setting up a political union, it is now too late to try and set up a political union. Europe has had a very bad experience over the last 10 years uh, on, on hardship suffered, especially by Greece, Spain, Portugal, Italy, and so on. And while countries eventually get out of it, you are leaving their future generations with no, no prospect of a better life. And for a Greek young person, the whole generation in Greece has lost out because unemployment is very high and the, the, the rules of economic policy say that the only way you can adjust is by cutting your own costs. There is no macroeconomic uh, uh, sort of uh, reflation possible under the rules. All you can do is to cut your wages, raise your productivity, and you know, that way lies, yes, you may be able to do it, but that way lies a lot of unemployment. 
But let's just go back to Britain for a moment. Um, Britain can now concentrate on Brexit, having now lost the flirtation with football that we had for a few <laughs> short weeks. So we can now get on with the things that really matter, making success of our economy. Uh, and our well, things are, which matter are no longer relevant. <laughs> Now we go to the trivialities. But are, are you more sanguine, let's say, about Mrs. May's potential for staying in power than you are about Mrs. Merkel? Because she does have her back to the wall in Berlin. No, I think you know, uh, people ought to kind of set up tutorials about how Mrs. May has been very, in a very stealthy way, effective by pretending to be a weak prime minister, everybody thought you know, she couldn't control her cabinet. Also, she didn't reveal her hand till the last Friday when she revealed her hand, got the entire cabinet to agree, despite the fact that there were some big beasts uh, you know, who were openly sort of defying her. But they all agreed. She got her agreement, and the fact that some cabinet minister resigned afterwards means that will have no effect. Had they resigned on the spot and challenged her, that would have mattered. But now she has established her control. She will get her way on Brexit. So it's a very interesting way to study how someone can leverage a, an image of weakness into a very powerful position. When she revealed her hand, they had the, the rivals had no cards to play. And so, you know, this is a very, very effective prime minister, and she will get a soft Brexit, which is in everybody's interest. A soft Brexit is in everybody's interest. Uh, and I also, it, it has to be said, ladies and gentlemen, that this man here, he is no Tory. This is a Labour peer, an old Labour war horse, who was the chairman of the Islington South Labour Party for some years. The chairman of the Islington North was Jeremy Corbyn, who's now the uh, head of the Labour Party. So you're a Labour supporter. You had a kind of wall through Islington, didn't you? A bit, a bit like a North and South Korea. There was you down in the South. Uh, I you, you, you were the successful part, weren't you? And the Jeremy Corbyn up in the North, that was the bit that was very dependent on China, wasn't it? <laughs> so so you, you're not a Tory supporter when you say that May has done quite well. No, absolutely, I'm not a Tory supporter, but I, you know, if the Conservative Party breaks up or gets into problems, the country suffers. You know, if we had a leadership challenge to Mrs. May last week, and then we went into a two to three months leadership election campaign and all that, there would have been no time to negotiate. What we need is Theresa May to stay in power, negotiate, and get us on the other side of 29th of March, 2019, uh, to be able to see. We need to know the shape of Brexit. There's a lot of uncertainty. Once we know the shape of Brexit, the British economy is versatile enough to be able to handle any adaptation. And are, you, uh, are you relatively optimistic now about the British economy? We have all these ladies and gentlemen in the room all full of money, all looking for places to invest. You know, would you counsel them to invest in Islington right now or maybe buy the Houses of Parliament and renovate the House of Lords? Oh, do, do, you, do you think London is a good place if, for, for, for you to put money? If somebody would buy the Westminster Palace, It'll make a fantastic order. Please take it off our hands. <laughs> now, uh, uh, but uh, no, I, I, think, I think the thing is, my, my, my picture of the British economy is that since the last world war, it adjusted to the loss of empire. Then it joined the European Union. When it, when it adjusts to the loss of the European Union, it will do all right because it is the quality of the labor force the entrepreneurial spirit of the people, the innovative you know, talent that the UK has. I mean, look at what they're doing in FinTech, what they're doing in AI already. I think the economy will be all right, but there will be a, a brief adjustment period. You know, the transition after 2019 is 20 months, so by end of 2020, we will have adjusted, we'll have realized the final shape of Brexit, and then I think, in a couple of years' time, the economy will bounce back. Of course, there's lots of Malaysians and, and Singaporeans in London as well, helping to fuel the economy. After all, we've got a, a Canadian governor of the Bank of England. Maybe exactly. we need a few Singaporean ministers to make the 
um, ministries work properly. But just one last question. I'm going to ask uh, Dennis and Jack to join us in a moment. We've just been the warm-up act, basically, for our two American friends. But what does all this mean for ASEAN? If you, you, you're back at the London School of Economics. You're doing a tutorial. You've had this mess in Britain. You've had this mess in Europe. You've got what seems to be a very vital part of the world economy, Southeast Asia. What three or four lessons would you draw for your pupils uh, from the experience of Europe and in Britain the last 30 years, would you give to your ASEAN students? What would you say no, no, you should I do? Would, the do's and the don'ts. I would say to my European students, go east, young man or young woman, because the real growth is here. You know, the, the, the vitality uh, and, and economic, continual economic growth uh, is basically in Asia. And it, that the way the movement has been for the last 25 years, and while the old world is still, uh, you know, still uh, has the wealth, old stock of wealth, the really new stuff is happening out here. And uh, it, it's quite remarkable, especially if, uh, well, after Brexit, UK will need the world more than, than it has needed so far. Uh, it, it'll seek friends. And if the European Union has problems with, with immigration and all that, if it, if it at least weakens, then again, it will need Asia to help it. And you know, so Asia should wait patiently and then buy off nice cheap bits and, and, and benefit from uh, uh, Europe. I, mean, this is, I seriously think that you know, the next 50 years, it is in ASEAN you know, and, of course, East Asia. What about a single currency? W would you set up the Rubinbi to basically be, be the currency that would run the whole of Asia? No. After the experience of Euro, I think single currencies are a bad idea. <laughs> because, you know, you, you know it, it's, it's like dollarization. You know, there were countries which dollarized, and they, 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 they controlled their hyperinflation, but having controlled their hyperinflation, they did not get decent growth from dollarization. We know that. Uh, and so, no, single currency. The euro is a constant reminder, don't go for a single currency, if you can help it. Just one last point, and then I will ask uh, Dennis and Jack to come up. Um, in Malaysia, there's been an election recently. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, worry and doubt about <laughs> corruption. Um, there's a prime minister. We, we mustn't comment too much on this because there's a, a trial due to take place. What lessons are there from the corruption case uh, in Malaysia for the rest of ASEAN, apart from the fact, go easy on the handbag buying. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mrs. Thatcher did very well with just one handbag, exactly. remember, which is a very famous handbag, which used to wave at President Mitterrand at summit meetings. It was extremely effective, but you don't need 257, do you? Absolutely. <laughs> no, you know, what's interesting about, you know, recently, I, I, last Saturday, I reviewed a book by James Crabtree, who was a FT writer. He's written a very good book on India, about billionaires in India and so on. Now, the question would be, is corruption really debilitating uh, for economic growth, or is it, uh, is it helpful? And I think the evidence is very, very mixed, because a lot of Asian countries, which are now developed, who had good 20, 30 years of growth, South Korea, for example, so on, had a lot of corruption. I mean, let's, let's face it. Corruption was ingrained into the system as a way of making the business and government cooperation fruitful. It doesn't always work. And if, if the corruption is one-sided and excessively greedy, like it was the case in, in, in Malaysia, I mean, that corruption wasn't actually fueling growth of private sector. It was just uh, you know, going into the pocket of one person. And then, you know, 4,000 handbags, you know. So I think, I think a system should have very good uh, rules and regulations to prevent corruption by uh, the political executive. It's very important. Because the political executive with centralized power can be fantastically much more corrupt than any business can be. Businesses should also be prevented from having corruption but again, if you have an economy with too many regulations, too many irrational you know, decisions, like India has, you know, a lot of what they call permit license uh, uh, system, then the prices are so distorted 
that you don't get the correct allocation without some kind of corruption. The corruption brings together the, the declared price and the, and the market price. And now, you know, I've, I, I tried to put this in, in my review and uh, the, the editor said, uh, the FT readers won't understand. This is too complex, what nonsense, you know. You should know that if there are too many regulations in an economy, the published prices do not reflect true scarcities. Good. Well, I'm sure you'll be writing a book on this uh, one no, of no. these days. Um, so uh, I, while uh, Jack uh, and, uh, and Dennis come up, I'd like you all to give a big hand to make that desire. Thank you very much.